Welcome to the His Call Technology Podcast, where we are communicating tomorrow's business needs today. From just outside Nashville, Tennessee, join His Call as we discuss all things telephony, data, and infrastructure related to business leaders. Here we go. Hello, this is Chuck, your host for this episode of the His Call Technology Podcast. How many of you recognize this sound? Did that take you back a few years? In August 1995, Wall Street was buzzing as a relatively new technology company's initial public stock offering created a sensation in financial circles. The initial public offering was planned to open at $14, but a last-minute decision doubled the stock price to $28 per share. The stock price climbed throughout the day, reaching a high of $75 per share with a market capitalization over $2 billion. This highly successful IPO launched widespread interest and investment in Internet companies. The Internet, 25 years ago, was just beginning to gain traction. Mosaic Communications Corporation was a 1994 startup company intending to capitalize on the World Wide Web by revolutionizing how we use the Internet. Their goal was to provide an improved interface that would make it more user-friendly and faster navigating all the information now available. With a $4 million capital investment, the company began development and shortly after released the initial version of Mosaic Netscape Internet Web Browser on October 13, 1994. In December, the company was renamed Netscape Communications and launched version 1.0 of Netscape Navigator. While it was not the first web browser, Netscape was the first internet tool that let the average user with a low bandwidth modem work with the internet interactively. It was the first to really begin to focus on the user experience. The browser was a huge success. In the early days of the internet, Netscape Navigator, as it became known, reigned supreme. In less than two years of the company forming, it went public in August 1995 company revenues doubled every quarter. That $4 million investment soon valued over $600 million. So tell me, what internet browser do you use? I've tried many of them. It's almost a hobby of mine. My default internet browser is currently Firefox, developed by the Mozilla Foundation. Take a guess where Firefox got its start. Mozilla was an internal name used at Netscape. The company released the source code for Navigator under an open source license. The development group overseeing the project became the Mozilla Foundation, a not-for-profit company that continues to develop Firefox for a better web experience for all of us. I'm going to bet none of you said your internet browser is Netscape Navigator. While Netscape Navigator was the dominant web browser during the 1990s, it had almost disappeared by 2003. The last update to Netscape Navigator 9 was March the 1st, 2008. Netscape was dominant for a few years, but it ultimately lost to Microsoft Internet Explorer. And where is that today? I won't get into all the details here, but the Internet Wars, as it's known, is really a very interesting story that you can catch online uh, on YouTube and places. The point of the story is many changes occur and a lot happens in 25 years. It's been a while since we recorded a podcast episode. 2020 happened as I focused on getting through the challenges of the pandemic, safer at home shutdowns, customers transitioning to work at home environments, and focused attention on upgrading out of date systems. The podcast took a back seat. But I'm excited today to be back in the podcast booth. As we kick off the new year, my guest is his call president and CEO, Gary Luffman. Welcome back to the podcast. Good morning, Chuck. It's been a long time. It has been a long time, but uh, it's going to be good to catch up today. Yeah. You know, Gary, last month in our Christmas message podcast, I told how my wife's papa would call her 
each Christmas and remind her that the Charlie Brown Christmas was coming on TV. He just thought she didn't need to miss that, even when she was an adult. Today, I'm going to share with you some wisdom from my wife's granny. In her 90s, granny told my wife, you've got to be tough to get old. And I've thought about the truth of that statement many times through the years. You know, in the grand scheme of things, 25 years doesn't seem all that long. While 25 years may not seem that long, for a business it can be a very long journey. As evidenced by the rise and subsequent disappearance of Netscape, many companies come and go well before the 25-year mark. You have to do a lot of things to make it in business. Would you say you have to be tough? Oh, definitely. (laughs) You have to be smart. You have to be flexible. You need to be agile. You need to be able to see things before they happen. You must be willing and able to quickly adjust to changing conditions and competitive landscapes. And I was thinking last night as we're getting ready to read a book forward, Mm -hmm. you have to be willing to keep moving forward. And I would say that's something that I admire about your leadership is you continue to move forward. And it's, it was evidenced last year in this pandemic, you continue to move forward and continue to invest in the business. It takes guts to be able to do that. Well, I appreciate the kind comments. My prayer life definitely has increased since we've uh, started this business. Sarah and I did uh, the 25 years starting in January. Mm-hmm. As we celebrate his call silver anniversary, you mentioned 25 years. We're going to talk about on this episode the history of our strength, kind of highlight some of the things in our timeline. If our listeners want to follow along, kind of see the uh, see the timeline that I'm talking about, I'll put a link in the show notes. You can, uh, you can go there, or you can just navigate uh, with your favorite browser to uh, www.hiscall.com. And from our homepage, select About Us, and then select our History of Strength dash timeline. It's one of the things it says on our timeline in 1996, His Call Telecommunications specializes in telephony services. But before that, <laughs> it says founded in 1995. Just real yeah. quick, we touched on the name and stuff in a previous episode in episode 24 but uh remind us the importance of 1995 founding the company but yet we're celebrating 25 years okay using 1996 yes it is true that we actually were founded in 1995 it was the latter part technically in december and in december 95 is when sarah and i came up with the company name i don't think that we had figured out to put the cross and the h yet to differentiate us and let people know that we're christian-based company i think that came along the first part of 96 when we were still trying to figure out the entire logo but as far as the company was founded yes is in in december 95 but we didn't exchange any money maybe i'd done a little work but we had not collected any money and i did not want to file anything with the irs and go public and then have to file pay for tax returns and stuff and have just zeros on it right so we just said well let's just make it january 1 in 1996 so that is kind of how that story went you talk about exchanging money i thought who who was your first customer do you remember who your first customer was well i can tell you that our first maintenance customer that we took care of and still do to this day is a transmission shop uh, right here in Dixon County, and it's Carl's Transmission. They're a fabulous transmission shop. We've used them for years whenever we need service. The story is that I go in to one of our first vehicles that we had, and I noticed the transmission was slipping or something, and I asked the gentleman. He, uh, The founder actually has passed away, and his uh, family still runs the business. I went into this gentleman, never seen him before, and I said, sir, I've got a problem here. And and he looked at me, and he said, well, we can sure take care of it. And I looked over the phone, and I said, uh, I looked over the counter, rather, and I said, well, this is, he said, what do y'all do? And I told him, I said, we take care of that. And he looked, and in a few choice words, he was not happy uh, with who was taking care of his system. And I said, well, we can sure take care of that system for you. And he said, well, all right, we'll do that. And that was it. And then from there, I mean, just things flourished. But no, we had 
one of the factories in town here. We had several customers in Nashville. In 1998, you had a company aircraft. So tell a listener some about the reason behind the aircraft. Well, the reason behind the aircraft was twofold, maybe threefold. First off, I became a pilot uh, in 1981, but uh, for about 15 years was kind of would fly and not fly. It was all about either you had the time or the you had to have the time and the money, and it either had one or the other, and sometimes neither. But in 1998, after starting his call in, in January 96, I'd gone two years there and really running hard because those four years were tough. Mm -hmm. uh, those four years were very, very hard. I was having a problem with getting around and also having no time to do anything else but work. Uh, with my full-time job where I was employed and then doing this and traveling, I was hardly at home. Sarah said, you need to do something. I said, well, I would like to fly again, and I think if we, if I could do that, I would, I'd get a little relaxation. And at the same time, I could speed up and get where I'm going, and that helped. Mm -hmm. So we got this uh, aircraft uh, in November of 98, and a lot of the jobs, if I was going any distance at all, especially in East Tennessee, right. just go out to the Nashville airport, get in the plane, and we kept it in Nashville then because that's where my full-time job was. So a lot of times I'd get off from that job, just go out to the airport, get in the plane, go fly off to go do a job, come back home and get home quicker. Mm -hmm. uh, flew a lot on the weekend flights to do some service calls or, or installs or whatever be the case because we were doing a lot of subcontracting then. We were a uh, Lucent Authorized Service Provider, an LASP, and we worked on a few other brands, but that was primarily what we worked on. But the plane really did come in handy uh, and has still uh, not as much as it used to be because um, because now we've got a wonderful staff of folks and a fleet of vehicles, and I don't have to pilot for business as much, but we still use it quite some to go to Knoxville to go to events. But that's how it came to be. Was So, uh, so the plane reinforces... To focus on service because it allowed you to better serve the customers through the years. Can you think of a time, can you share a story where you've used the aircraft to get a customer back up in service? Or Oh, yes. There have been times that there will be total outages out at uh, like a nursing home at, in East Tennessee uh, uh, out of, uh, oh, gosh, I think I, one time I had to go to Kansas the plane and I have been everywhere from Teterboro, New Jersey, to work in New York City. Gosh, that was years ago, but in Manhattan, New York, I did a job there. Uh, put in two systems and networked them together. We've been to Florida several times, Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, gosh, uh, Cincinnati, Cleveland, just all over the eastern half of the United States practically. And, yes, it does help to get service. Sometimes it's just to deliver the parts for somebody that can help us. That all came to being, too, after the 9-11. Um, uh, there was times that the plane was useful because you couldn't put parts on a plane right then. They, oh, they were being yeah. so cautious. You If you didn't have the right licensing used to you could just deliver parts off at a counter and they would take them and carry them on the plane they don't do that mm -hmm. so sometime we have to fly in 2010 uh, when the flood happened chuck we couldn't get even our staff on the other side of nashville mm -hmm. so i remember one day gosh i made about four hops taking to fly over we went to um, kentucky went to to drop off parts went over to murfreesboro to drop off parts went to um, another part of kentucky uh, taking uh, one of our technicians to, to help the crew up there so yes I, I remember one time i think i'm remembering this correctly we had an employee working in another state mm -hmm. that fell had a fall in missouri in, in, missouri. in missouri that's right and mm -hmm. injured herself um, and if I'm remembering correctly, you flew up there to get her. Well, what happened, her husband called me. It was probably about late morning, 
And I was actually going to try to take a day off that day. And he called me on my cell and told me that she was on this job in Missouri and had fallen and uh, wasn't able to drive back. Would I be able to fly him to that town? And I said, yes, let me uh, check a few things here, the weather and so forth. We'll take off about this time. So I went in, changed clothes, filed a flight plan, picked him up at the airport, and went straight to the town that she was working in in Missouri, um, and then left him there. They were She was very happy to see us, obviously, and that allowed him to be able to drive her back in their car. Gary, I know it's on the timeline in 2003 was his call's first VoIP install. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when in 96... Wasn't a lot of talk about uh, <laughs> voice over IP. Oh, and yes. And so here in in 2003, you'd have your first VoIP installed. Do you remember it very well? Very, very well. <laughs> um, our first uh, uh, VoIP install was actually 2002. Uh, the timeline may say 03, but, but there again, I think the billing started in 03. In 2002, at that time, we were only selling the Avaya brand. Avaya had announced that they had the Enterprise, and they had just announced, I was in Florida at an event when they were announcing the IP office. And we have one customer that is enterprise level that, believe it or not, still to this day is using that system. Is that right? Uh, Yes. They are in the process now with us to convert over to newer technology. But at the time, that was the hot item. Mm -hmm. This customer was going to expand and needed more connectivity, and it seemed to fit the bill. And I can remember so well uh, a couple of I folks doing a presentation the Avaya folks were so excited, and they hadn't even, Chuck, at that time, come up with the name of the product. It was the S8700 that you know very well. But at that time, Avaya was calling it Stingray and Seahawk. I just Googled that, and I'd see if I remembered. That's what I was uh, remembering correctly, yes. Oh, yeah. The Stingray and Seahawk. It was the S8700 and the mm-hmm. S8300. Yep. And they could talk it, and they whiteboarded it. Well, as Bruce Moore has said many times, everything works good on PowerPoint. <laughs> what happened is this this is a uh, wonderful customer of ours who's been with us for, well, since the time of his call's inception. They were making a lot of changes, and they, need, they had a reason to have to have two sites working, their two main sites, by Memorial Day. Well, this was, gosh, I think uh, February or March. The value folks were so excited to get the first sale. They made promises they couldn't keep. And I can remember when they said, he said, well, I'll pull some strings. I can make this happen, get this product here. And all I knew is the two customers looked at me. Mm -hmm. And I felt in my peripheral, the lady to my left who I've known for years and the gentleman I just met across the table. And they just looked at me and I said, and I put my hands up. I said, listen, I'm not going to promise you that, that we will get it. I will promise you this. If you do buy this product from me, I will loan you whatever it takes to get you going, and you will not lose a phone call. Mm -hmm. And we made our commitment. Mm -hmm. Now, what that story is about is, sure enough, the product did work, but it took two of our folks camping out from the time the, the product started arriving until we finally got them up about the first of, the latter part of November, the first of December, the bank now remember had to open memorial day Mm -hmm. so from memorial day um until the end of the year they were using equipment that we put in place to make the connectivity between the two locations uh their their uh, operations center and their main location they've seen what we've been able to do for them here they've been a wonderful customer all these years and they're still with us they still trust you they're still still with you Yep. At the same time, we had we sold uh, an IP office, the mm-hmm. first release 1.0. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You want to talk about the bleeding edge. That Both those products put us on that. I made the same promise to that customer, and they actually called me when I was in Florida listing, finding out that this new value product was coming out. One of the managers and the owner of this distributorship called me and said, hey, we want to see about changing out our phone system here. What do you know about this VOIP stuff? 
I said, well, your size business would need this, and I'm actually at a rollout right now where Avaya is making a presentation. Let me get some stuff together. He said, well, we need a price. I said, okay. Well, I made them the price. They signed off on the deal. They needed two. There again, they needed two locations. They had a, in Nashville and in Jackson, Tennessee, and wanted connectivity. And I promised them the same thing. I said, well, if, we're, if this product isn't ready, because, guys, it is brand spanking new, I will put you in something free of charge and give you connectivity. So there again, now that system, it, it went, Chuck, it was probably about a year or a year and a half later before it actually uh, came up mm-hmm. and, and was functional. But today, IP Office is one of our best sellers. Oh, and, by thing. The, and by the way, we're blessed too because that customer is still a customer of ours too still after all these years. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to touch on just briefly, it talks about the change in servicing our customers. In 2007, HisCall introduced the HERO program with MCC. That's the HisCall Emergency Response with um, Mobile Communication Center. Correct. Talk a little bit about that program. We're going to have a episode specifically talking about HERO. Okay. Uh, but touch on the MCC portion just a moment, and then we'll talk about how because we don't have the MCCs anymore. No. Well, okay, back in 2005 and six, I would say, I was seeing that the number one culprit that, that we find is a or number one service problem that we have when people call in and, and if customers say, no, my phones don't work. Well, the dispatchers know to ask a few questions. Can you call internally or can you call externally? So it'll be the carrier is down. So recognizing that the carrier business is so fragile, I wanted to come up with something and and an idea. Now, we have an advisory board here, and it helps us to get a feel for what's going on in their industries, and then they are privy to knowing what we're thinking here and what we are thinking about doing. And it was probably about the 2005, one of the meetings there, I asked them about, what do you folks think about doing this? And they thought it would be a great idea. We started in 2006, I guess, uh, evolving and designing and building out a mobile command center. And our folks did a fabulous job. And by 2007, we were ready to roll. And uh, it did provide a lot of uh, good activity at the time. The logo and everything on the side actually came up, once again, from my wife, Sarah, who I said, honey, we need to come up with a name for this. I was explaining what all we're doing. She thought about it and came up with HERO, H-E-R-O. And she said, it's His Call Emergency Response Operations. I said, fantastic, that's great. So that was plastered on the side of this RV that we bought and then was put on another cargo van that we tricked out, I guess you'd say, Mm -hmm. with another dish on top of that. For several years, they were used. We made trips in Alabama for uh, when they, when the tornadoes I hit. I remember that. The flooding in Nashville in 2010, all sorts of different times. But as far as it ever really paying for itself, no, it was so expensive to do. But what happened is one day we were, we were doing our weekly testing. We bring the vehicle out. It starts automatically searching for the satellite, and it can't find anything. Oh, yeah. And lo and behold, we called the uh, satellite provider of the service, which is Clear Channel. Now, those folks are very good folks. I've been out their place in Colorado. And by the way, we had a link between us and Colorado. And the way this thing would work, it would go out, connect to a satellite. Our truck would be out there connecting to the customer's infrastructure. And we would satellite link from their location to Colorado. And then there was a point-to-point circuit between Colorado and us here in Dixon. We could forward calls. We could give bandwidth. It, it, it provided a lot of good, good business and got people operationally. We use it for all sorts of businesses, but uh, what happened the day we went up, uh, come to find out the provider of that equipment had gone out of business, Mm -hmm. unannounced. So when I called Clear Channel, I said, what's up? What's going on? Have you guys got a problem? They said, no, the company that y'all bought all your equipment from has gone out of business. I said, well, who took them over? They said, nobody. I said, you mean they just gone? They said, yeah, just gone. So I, I said, what's our options? They said, buy another brand of equipment now at that time we bought that was the brand that they recommended and i went back to the board 
and I told them, I said, folks, we got a problem. And again, this is probably five, six, seven years into the making. And uh, they said, no, we, we would agree that you've done well. You've got other means. You can take care of customers. The technology's changed so much. And so we did not go with another company uh, to, to build out those vehicles again. So that's kind of the story behind so, that. So, you know, that the, the change in technology is kind of where I wanted to go. Mm-hmm. You no longer are, you know, with bandwidth has become so prolific and so mm-hmm. available that we can now do much of what we were doing by rolling the MCC to the customer, yeah. beaming the satellite, getting them service back to their system, we are able to do that today. We with, are uh, his call pl- cloud services. We are today, Chuck. Is there's so much that has changed since the days that we had the MCC. It was the thing at the time that was needed, but with the advent of more of cloud technology and more VOIP, and now the advent of SIP technology using bandwidth to bring voice traffic over is so much the preferred method sadly carriers can be very fragile just as we found out with AT&T and as we found out with Windstream back in the tornadoes that came through Nashville in yeah. March both times we were able to help people but that's because we've invested in our own cloud technology and the way this works as long as somebody has bandwidth, we can help them. So what I recommend to my customers and have been for years is have two different providers for Internet. Two different providers. Uh, if, if you're going to stay with true uh, telephony, you might want to consider having two providers of that. But if today, if somebody just has one provider for their voice, and if they would be willing to buy have two providers for their Internet, and the reason I say that because we've all seen outages. I mean, sure. things are going to happen. There are sometimes regional outages that do affect customers. My suggestion to anybody would be to have two different providers, uh, share your business there. Uh, let's talk about how we can do uh, voice traffic over your bandwidth. To me, that's just good insurance. Mm-hmm. Redundancy has been a, a hot topic recently with, yes. with what's happened here in Nashville. Um, another thing that uh, has was critical in this deal with the bombing in Nashville were security cameras. I know I've heard you talk about, in, you know, just in the recent past, the importance of having a high quality security camera that gives you good detail. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think any of our listeners would be able to relate to this. You're home at night. You're watching the news. And the police come on, and it may be at Walmart, it may be at some other store somewhere, and they say, if you've seen this person, please notify police. And it's somebody with a fuzzy picture in a parking lot. And I keep looking at that like, how can anybody help when all you can see is a blurred image? Chuck, in 2008, when the downturn of the economy, when Wall Street crashed, it was then I thought, we've got to do more than just telephones and cabling but also thought we have one of the very very best cabling and fiber groups of anybody in the whole country we have uh, uh bixie we've had i think we've talked about it on another we podcast a, yeah great episode on uh, bixie if you want more information on that uh, check out that episode but. and today we have now three rcdds on staff uh, we've had one that's had his rcdd for a while he also teaches the Bixie uh, classes. And then this year, we now have two more people. That's right. That's a big deal, too. That's a, that's, that's that's a, a tough certification. That's a huge deal. It's kind of like having a Ph.D. of cabling and fiber. Yeah. I'm thinking, with the talents that we've got here, what else could we do with the cable and fiber infrastructure? As I said, mentioned, seeing things on TV and police needing help and i'm i'm a big supporter of the police and the military and all and i'm thinking what can we do to help these people obviously it's going to be putting in better quality cameras you mentioned a moment ago about redundancy i'm a big believer in redundancy just to let our listeners know here at his call in dixon we have two providers of internet service bandwidth from AT&T and Comcast are the only two that that can bring it all the way to you in Dixon. So we we have contractual agreements with both to bring it in over fiber. 
We use Comcast as a backup on the coax. We've increased our bandwidth on these. We've got uh, in Knoxville at our Knoxville location, we have uh, the, the two that bring it to your door there is uh, Spectrum and TDS. We have agreements with both of them. And we're in the process right now of increasing the bandwidth between Comcast and Spectrum to get to Knoxville office. We've had a link between us and Knoxville for many, many years, but we're now increasing that bandwidth because the future is going to be that everybody's going to need more bandwidth uh, for all sorts of things. But we we have multiple paths of getting communication here, so anybody doing business with us will have that. And in addition, as you know, we have two generators here. One generator is great, two is even better. One of our generators is on natural gas, and the other one uh, is a much, much larger one. The The first generator will take care of all of our critical equipment. The second generator, our large one, takes care of the entire building, and it's operational for, uh, I believe, 12 uh, eight-hour days uh, without a, a, a diesel refueling. we got a really large tank. So we could operate at his call, Lord willing, as long as we had natural gas and diesel for a minimum of 12 full functioning days and then beyond that if we didn't get a diesel delivery we can still operate on the natural gas uh, on all of our critical equipment for for a long long time i mean Mm -hmm. as long as we got the gas flow to me you can't rely on just one source of anything i don't care if it's carrier services or or diesel generators or whatever be the case i believe the redundancy is critical it's important for our customers to know we'll be here. It's going to be increasingly important for our cloud customers. You, we announced on uh, His Call Technology Podcast Episode 8, His Call's Cloud, and that we've continued to see that grow this past year. You've continued to move forward, as I talked about earlier, in investing in that and in, in bandwidth and power redundancy. Mm-hmm. We've added features and capabilities to that. Another thing that we talked about in episode one, we talked about the front desk assistant and the Neo face facial recognition. Oh, yeah. We had some exciting stuff come together this past year in that. And we've got cameras at the doors now. We talked about this on the mm. episode that the camera, when you walk up, the camera will see you. If it recognizes you, it'll open the door and let you unlock the door. Mm. And you can come right on inside. If you haven't been here before, it'll prompt somebody to come meet you it's all exciting stuff that product is actually by nec his calls one of or maybe the only one in the uh, southeastern half of the united states that they've approved to do facial recognition and and we also helped develop some things some of the ideas we've had they've even taken back to japan and taken the one just do little videos and uh, short clips and we've done that but yes we've uh, been able to they have a program called uip we have the ability to write and work off of the UIP. And what that does is uh, hook devices to this tied into the system. So, for example, as you mentioned, unlocking the door. Then we added, um, and they had that, but uh, and, and they told us how to do it. So we got that working. Well, then we added... Uh, voice over the top and it, you actually did the recording yeah, that's for right. us it's my voice that says there's two recordings out there folks and one of them says if if you're recognized and you're in our system uh, chuck's voice comes on and says welcome back to his call please come inside the door unlocks and you come in if you're not in the system it says something like welcome to his call please press this button somebody will be with you in a moment pressing the button rings phones people in the building see on monitors uh, who it is talk to them uh, two-way and then push the button let them in they meet them up front we we carry that even further though with a with a mail carrier and other people vendors that are regulars the mail carrier is a good story because we have one regular mail carrier and the one that comes in on his days off so we put both these people in the system Mm -hmm. they come to the foyer look in the camera it unlocks the door. Your voice comes on and says, welcome back to his call. Please come inside. But then there's another step that it automatically generates an email to the ladies in the business office that takes turns every week to go meet whoever is up front and the mail carrier. So by the time that the mail carrier comes in with a, loaded with packages and whatever, they can open the door. And by the time they get to the counter, setting them down, somebody's greeting them. Right. Automatically. The, yep. the, the mail carriers absolutely love it. it oh, just, I know they do. Yeah. Joey was pretty excited on another feature he, that uh, was added to, oh, integrated look. with Neoface. He took me down to one of our conference rooms. He said, hey, Chuck, check this out. 
We went to the conference room. He said, notice it's all dark. He said, all right, now go to the front door and come back inside. Yeah. I said, okay. So I come in. I, I walk up to the to the camera, to the door, and it says, welcome back to his call. Please come inside. So I come in. He said, now go, let's go back to the conference room. We go back to the conference room, and, and it's lit up with uh, uh-huh. it's got a little we, with these uh, low voltage LED lights <laughs> oh, yeah. and stuff we've been doing. It's, it's lit up red, so it knew yeah. my preferences. It knew you know that that uh, I was in the building and that uh, I was. It had set the conference room to my preferences that that they had set up to show me. Well, it was pretty exciting. You remember it's been over a year ago when we talked about this. You started thinking about I'd like it that I could walk in the yeah. building. It would turn on some lights and that's it would right. Do, even even log my computer in for me. That's right. Well, we hadn't gone that far with the computer <laughs> login, Chuck, but, yeah, we, we've got it where, uh, yeah, so if somebody wants to, for whatever reason, set up a meeting room with certain lighting, turn on projectors or flat screens or whatever on certain functions, we can program in the system the facial recognition that if somebody has got a room space reserved for such and such time, uh, all these parameters, we can make it so that when it recognizes your face, it can automatically fire up the presentation room to your liking, uh, yeah. change the colors, because these low-voltage LED lighting mm-hmm. uh, is wonderful. And, yes, we can turn on the brightness of the light, the colors of the light, uh, any background you want to do, set the sound the way you want to, whatever you want to do. Yeah, it's it's exciting. Uh, another product that... Uh, that we picked up last year that created a lot of conversation is the uh, temperature mm. screening uh, mm-hmm. solution. Yes, that is still evolving. We're in talks again now with another manufacturer product. We've got one that we recommend highly that works well. We've sold several of them. It's not very expensive at all, and you put these on tripods or you can mount them. It's a small camera that's roughly four inches by four inches square and a, and a sensor that's about the same si- exact size. And most people are putting these up on tripods, and you hook it into a laptop, and the customer can set the parameter to whatever temperature. This company focuses in on the eyeball Mm -hmm. because that seems to be the most accurate spot. So the person stands within five feet right here. It will be planted um, on a tripod, a sensor. You stand beside the sensor, and it regulates your temp to that sensor that's how it come it can be so accurate the company that developed all this they've been very very involved over the years with helping firefighters and uh, with cameras to see in hot spots in mm-hmm. rooms before they go into those hot spots so with the coronavirus hit they tried to help out in that market and they've taken off doing well with that uh, oh, and they've also come out with a tablet so for the people who don't want to have to have a uh, computer it's a tablet model it does the same thing Mm-hmm. Then there's some other companies out there that do these as standalone where you don't have to have the sensor. They're, we're talking to some of them right now. In any case, if the, if the person is, temperature is above the threshold and the customers can set their own thresholds, then it can either ding and pass them through or make a little buzzer sound like don't don't go any further. Well, when that happens, it can also email whoever the customer wants emailed to, mm-hmm. HR department, management, or whatever. We actually had a case at a factory that we sold our first unit to, actually, and they had an employee come in one time. What they were doing is they were having their employees come into uh, an entrance. They stand there. It takes three seconds, and, you know, ding, ding, people go through, and then all of a sudden, eh, and the other employees see are there in line, standing six feet apart, looking over their shoulder. Management says, you got a fever, and didn't even know. The person did not even know it. Sent them to the doctor. Sure enough, they had COVID. That helped them and more than paid for that device. T- probably paid for it in, in, in 30 minutes of labor time mm-hmm. at that factory because mm-hmm. it, it was uh, it, they would have had to shut down. Yeah, it automates the process. I've been mm-hmm. to several customers where you, you walk in, and they have a little yeah device that they hold up and manually do so and you know what in real and, and to be fair to everybody listening in real life sometimes the electronic thermometer may be all you need i try to be a practical person if you're in a medical company and this person's already having to stand there and ask you questions then yeah the 30 dollar little thermal gun may be all that they really have to have <clears throat> but when you don't have somebody there that that's their job people really ought to consider some automated way like this that's good 
Well, Gary, thanks for uh, coming in and celebrating 25 years with me today. Kind I've of, enjoyed it, Chuck. Good to be back in the studio, even though this is not my favorite thing to do, <laughs> but I'll, I'll be glad to do it to help out. But thank you for having me. I think as we wrap up, Gary, as we celebrate 25 years, it's probably important that uh, we recognize the key to our success is our customers. And we should, you know, I want to say thank you to our customers. Thank you to our listeners. We appreciate every opportunity you give us to earn your business. I would have to agree with you, but I'm going to say something else, too. And as the the officer that uh, people watch the news about, the again, the, the bombing, and they had the six officers that that were deemed now heroes. Yes. That, that one of the officers stood there, and he was getting a little choked up. And he said, I'm going to say something that's not politically correct. So, Chuck, I'm telling you something right, right now, not politically correct, just like that man did. God took care of them that day, and he that's said right. it. The good Lord is definitely taking care of all of us here at his call. And, yes, our customers have been wonderful. We've been so blessed with them. And by the grace of God, we're here and we're doing well we're actually excited about the uh the times times in the world today are tough but mm-hmm. but there is still some excitement about some of the things that we can do to help people in the market that's right thank you for that gary that's a good word thank you again for listening and uh, we'll wrap up as we do every episode don't be afraid only believe Thanks for taking the time to listen to the His Call Technology Podcast. Subscribe to this podcast so you can stay up to date with today's business communication trends. To learn more about His Call solutions for your business needs or to listen to previous podcasts, visit us at our website, hiscall.com.